Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, Colloquium. I'm Francesco Petruccione, the Interim Director of NITEX. <clears throat> and this afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Nico Orce. <clears throat> Nico is a professor of the University of the Western Cape, so he's not far away <laughs> from us. He's also uh, an adjunct of Associate Professor at the University of York. He's a member of many of the fancy nuclear physics labs in the world, yeah? uh, from CERN to Itemba labs and almost everything uh, in, in between. Yeah? <clears throat> Nico is also uh, not only a, a famous NITEX associate, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's also passionate about uh, uh, training and, uh, and transformation issues within uh, uh, university in particular. Yeah? <clears throat> and he's also the organizer of this uh, conference series Tastes of Nuclear Physics, uh, which last year was at University, or this year was at the University of Western Cape, yep. and next year I'm not sure. Well, Might it be here? <laughs> maybe here. <laughs> Might it be here? Okay, but you are here to listen to Nico and not to me. So Nico, we are really very curious to hear what you're telling us about elements out there. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank much, you very man. much, Nico, for being with us today. Thank, Thank you, you, Francesco. Thank you so much for for the invitation. The first time I am in a, in a cinema giving a presentation, so that's a. I'm, I'm very. Um, I thank all the organizers, uh, Rene and Francesco, to invite me, and the University of Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch University. So today I will present on the universality of elemental abundances. Uh, we'll explain a little bit of what that means, and uh, basically we are going to connect the micro and the macro worlds in uh, the way you will see. So if you want to know more about us, there's a, a web page here. Then we have our GitHub that uh, Nikita, who is in the audience, she keeps developing. It's a very nice one where our colleagues from all over the place, they, they go and check the programs and the codes that they're using nuclear physics generally. Uh, programs that you are using nuclear physics and this is the YouTube channel where we have almost uh, 900 sub subscribers we're waiting for a thousand so once we make a thousand we can get some cash and we can invest in the students so if you want to get a thousand you need a little bit of funding we can always help if we get some many views there are many thousands of views in those uh, on in those uh, those videos so I am going to present a road trip uh, towards the understanding of how elements are created. So we have uh, uh, on this side, you have a typical picture of the nuclear shard. Um, you have different astrophysical paths where uh, elements are somehow created. Uh, according to where you are, you have the RP process, which is the rapid proton uh, capture process. You have different T process, but we are interested today in this R process and a process which goes along the line of stability, these black squares here, which is called the S process. But mainly on the R process, the rapid neutron capture, which happens in a stellar nucleosynthesis. This is not the, the, the beginning or the end of a trip. I like this reference, this poem by, by Kavafi. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of, of adventure, full of discovery. Like Stregonian, Cyclops, Angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. This is the way you must feel about doing physics, and this is what we are trying to convey today. So, to me, this story started at the University of Oxford, where I gave a, a, a nuclear physics talk at the Young Physicist Conference in 2002, a little bit over 20 years ago. And the winner will go to an international conference in Hungary. So obviously, we have questions at the end. I was competing, and some of the, some of the panel members asked me, you know, she say, the only thing uh, I remember about nuclear physics is the the, the semi-empirical mass formula for the binding energy. 
is it is being used nowadays. So at that time, I was doing my PhD, and I didn't know what funds. Um, oh no, I don't think so. Maybe. <laughs> so that was enough not to win the prize. You don't doubt. If any, anyone asks you a question, you need to be certain. But at that time, I didn't know this uh, this uh, binding energy curve developed by by Bette and by Saka a long time ago, if it was used at all. So I didn't go to Hungary that time, but I listened to some of the talks, you know, by by this gentleman here. I went to Oxford University. It was beautiful. Obviously, this is Roger Penrose, who recently won the Nobel Prize. He is a, a beautiful speaker, one of the best. So then, the 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 trip, this road trip, took me a while, many years, to to investigate the the something called the nuclear polarizability, which was related, as I, I will show you, with the same empirical mass formula. And this work, after going to University of Oxford, was published eventually <laughs> 23 years at Oxford University Press, which I think was a, a funny coincidence, how I was uh, made aware of the same empirical mass formula 22 years ago, 23 years ago, and it ended up it at the at the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is one of the top uh, astrophysics, uh, astronomy and astrophysics journals in the world. But that's the story I'm going to tell you today, and it starts with obviously Einstein, EMC square, you know, in stars in the interior of AGB stars, asymptotic giant branches. You can see that we can produce a stellar fusion up to iron because these release energy. But when you reach the most uh, bound nucleus, which is not iron 56, but it's actually uh, nickel 62, you cannot produce more, more energy going this way. So that's the end of elements being produced in the interior of stars. So we need to, people thought, and you know, well thought that the rest of the elements from iron are produced by neutron capture but there's no Coulomb barrier. And you can see here, this is the, again, the same empirical mass formula that approximates very nicely the masses of the elements. And I already want to mention this symmetry energy here, this coefficient, which balance the addition of neutrons, uh, of the neutron to proton ratio in nuclei, as you become more neutron rich, as you capture more neutrons. As you can see, the greater this number, the smaller will be the binding energy because there's a negative sign here. I just uh, mentioned that. And this is the main question we were trying to, to answer. How are the elements from iron to uranium made? You see all these elements, we know they happen in the interior of the stars. You know, here is iron, but then the rest that we see in the periodic table, they're supposed to be produced in explosive uh, scenarios, you know, where atoms heavier than iron are, are forged or minted, where there is a ready supply of neutrons. You need to neutron capture, neutron capture, and eventually you have the beta decay back to the line of stability. Although the specifics of how this happens are unknown, and that's why this was the num question number three in this journal, where they were, you know, they were posting what they thought they were the 11 greatest unanswered questions in physics. They thought at the beginning it was a, a supernova, but late, le, uh, they understood that some of the heaviest elements, such as gold and lead, are formed in, power, in powerful blasts that occur when two neutron stars collide. So we can answer questions. You don't need to answer questions. Just go to, just can go to chat GPT, and you can ask, you know, what is, uh, how many, <laughs> you know, can you have a star or planet made entirely of uranium? Oh, maybe. It's theoretically possible, blah, blah, blah. They always provide an answer. You know, you have to be careful because this answer, normally it's a painstaking effort to answer these kind of questions. But ChatGPT will tell you whatever is available online or whatever it does. So we'll see today that because there's a universality of elements and all elements are produced in similar ways, wherever you are in the universe, that's we. What we propose here, obviously, we're going to have this planet made up of uranium 
as someone was asking to the chat GPT. So the composition of matter, this is what we knew before. Viktor Weisskopf, Physics Today, 1961, is a product of nuclear reactions, which have taken place a long time ago in the stars or in star explosions. Hence, the material basis of the world in which we live is a product of the laws of nuclear physics. And he cannot illustrate it better than by showing the relative abundance of chemical elements in the solar system. You can see uranium is here at the bottom. The top most abundant element is hydrogen and helium that were produced in the Big Bang. And then the rest are produced a little bit of helium, beryllium maybe, boron, also in the Big Bang. The rest are produced by different nuclear reactions. And this already tells you that you cannot have uranium, a planet made up, of, made up of uranium. However, you know, you could have a special path where uranium is produced you know, over other elements. Today we'll see that that's not uh, a possibility. So abundance of elements above iron, we have two processes. One is the, the slow neutron capture that happens in the, in the interior of stars. Then these stars, these AGB stars, become they are vibrating and they have become unstable. And this satellite, the Gaia satellite, just shows how this 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 mass, huge masses go and get expelled from the star and contribute to the to the elements, uh, to the abundance of elements in our universe. That happens, as I mentioned before, through the slow neutron capture. And as we assume that we understand that slow neutron capture. We just try to understand what is the abundance of elements as we see, we observe in our universe. So the rest we assume is going to be because of the, uh, of the rapid, of the rapid uh, neutron capture or R process, which happens recently has been observed in neutron star mergers. And each of them creates 50% of the elements beyond iron. These are the different properties. Main the slow process obviously has a few neutrons, and it takes many years, whereas the rapid uh, or the R process takes a, a few seconds, or microseconds, and there's a lot of neutrons being produced. So basically, you capture neutron, capture neutron, capture neutron, until the capture of a neutron is not favorable, reaching, as I, as I mentioned later, the drip line, the neutron drip line, and then the, the, the elements, you know, the isotopes decay by beta, beta minus, and then it goes back to the line of stability. So here is the typical process of the S process, where you go around the stable nuclei. You capture one neutron, one neutron, one neutron, one neutron, one neutron. You cannot go farther, then go back. One neutron, go back. There's not many neutrons to go farther, right? So you go just along the line of stability of these stable nuclei. These are the black squares that we see in the nuclear shard. This is the, uh, 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 the S process, and there are different S processes, depending on, uh, you know, you can have helium core burning, as I mentioned before, AGB stars, and you can have metal poor AGB stars as well, and they all produce the S process. But we are, today, we're focusing on the R process and how elements are produced in the R process. For many years, the astrophysical side where our processes are occurring has been has been unknown for to all of us. At the beginning, we thought, okay, supernova may have enough neutron neutrons to to produce this neutron capture. But in 2017, it was predicted by by my Spanish colleague Martinez Pinedo that a blue light curve called a kilonova will be emitted as a, a result from the radioactive decay of LIDAR process nuclei in low opacity ejecta. This ejecta is the ejecta created after the collision between the two, the two neutron stars, the, two, the neutron star mergers come, and then there's an ejecta, which is called the kilonova, and has a particular pattern. And from that pattern, from that kilonova, it was observed, uh, this is the typical black body spectrum, and there was a little bump here, a little absorption absorption profile, which was identified with a strontium-2 line moving at about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 speed of light. 
I don't believe these things. As, as I, I don't believe everything, you know, because or you believe, but with a grain of salt, because there's only a, there's only one line, one absorption line being observed, strontium two. So there are other possibilities that the people are discovering now, maybe tellurium, maybe yttrium, and there are even more possibilities which actually kills the whole thing. This can be also people su uh, suggest that there can be also an absorption line from helium one, which is not produced in their process, right? It's produced in the Big Bang. So things are still open question. It's an open question of, although most people now believe that everything happens in the in neutron star mergers, but we have to be careful and we need to expect, uh, wait for more data to come. So these elements are produced in the cooling of, uh, in the cooling down of neutron star mergers and that's Kilonova being ejected, where the nursery of our process heavy elements are produced. And you can see that at the beginning, this has a high, very high temperature of 40 to 50 MeV, 5 to 10 to the 11 Kelvin. And this is determined by heavy ion collisions and simulations. Then you have a gamma ray bursts, kilonova ejecta, hadrons, quark, gluon, plasma. Everything happens very fast, Prot pro uh, proton and neutrons. And then as the temperature goes down, you cool down the, this way, you have typical temperatures around 1 MeV which is about 10 to the uh, to the 10 Kelvin, where seed elements are created before charge reactions freeze out. So you have a high neutron to seed ratio. You keep going down in temperature, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. No one really know the limits, this range, but it's assumed that 0 0.4, 0 0.5 neutron capture occurs until it also freezes out by meaning of you are, you are losing the neutrons. You're gonna have neutrons forever. And eventually, everything beta decays at lower temperatures, and neutrons are finally consumed, and all this goes to the ground state of nuclei. So these temperatures also imply that nuclei are not in the ground state, as we normally measure things uh, on Earth, but in terms of masses, we measure masses on normally for the ground state, but the, um, the state of of matter at that, at that uh, in this uh, neutron uh, neutron capture is at higher excitation energy, which is going to be relevant to this talk. So this is the typical nuclear landscape. You have these black squares, and you have this terra incognita that no one knows about. This is supposed to be the neutron drip line where nuclei become become unbound. And there's nothing else you can produce because then you lose the proton and the neutrons. And this is the proton drip line here. These are the known nuclei so far. But as you can see, there's a, very, a lot of terra incognita in this relevant R process where neutron capture may go all the way you know, here and then come back by beta decay to the, to the black squares, to the stable nuclei. So, in more detail, as I mentioned before, there are different, this is the same nuclear shard with different uh, phenomena. As you can see, weak processes in supernova, P process goes here, and this is the R process. This is, as I mentioned before, the neutron drip line. And you can see the different X-ray bursts, different astrophysical sites happen with different S process, depending on the, ne on the, on the density of the neutrons, the temperature, the binding energy, etc. So as we are um, talking about the R process, there's a, obviously we have to reach somewhere into the neutron drip line. However, the predictions of the neutron drip line and R process path, they differ. Yeah, you, got, you can have, a, 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 you have four skerm and one relativistic interaction, and this is a mass model. As you can see, there's a huge discrepancy between the different models. And this is because there's a significant variation due to the wide range of conditions, experimental conditions, not accurately determined, which implies you, we don't know the masses in this, in this region. So it's very difficult if you don't know the masses, you know what is the binding energy, and obviously what is the trip line where nuclei become unbound. So, uh, 
studies of uh, nuclear interactions in systems with high or extreme neutron to proton ratios, the symmetry energy I was mentioning before at the beginning, are crucial of, uh, for understanding the neutral drip line. It was uh, mentioned by Francesca Samarruca in this journal, Symmetry 2023. 20, and uh, as you can see, actually, from the binding energy curve, if you can actually change to the typical coefficients in any book, any nuclear physics book, you will see that the convergence of the symmetry energy for heavy nuclei establishes the frontier of the Newton drip line. This number here tells you how far we can go this way, right? Towards the Newton drip line. So now let's uh, analyze the, about the universality of abundances, why we call this universal patterns. Uh, we, we can see here the abundances in six R process galactic halo stars with uh, the solar system, the blue curve, the blue line is the solar system. As you can see, the pattern for these R process uh, abundances is very similar. So the abundances of these metal poor stars, six of them, are consistent with the solar system R process only abundance pattern. And this was a, 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 an indication that we may have a universal pattern for the abundance of elements, which was, was, was uh, further confirmed uh, by looking at, at uh, this is the first, what they call it, the first R process galaxy, reticulum two stars. And again, these reticulum two stars show a similar pattern to our sun and to the six previous metal poor stars as we gain more and more data um, we normalize their process element abundances of all these stars we see that there's a, a clear pattern which agrees with our solar abundances it's a typical spectrum that you see to these absorption lines to determine the abundances in these metal poor stars and as Anna Frebel mentioned here Given that the sun is a population one, is a form billions of years after these metal poor stars, they are population two in astronomy. These are the kind of the first stars still existing. This population one is like after many many generations of stars. It's a more complicated spectrum for the sun, but these metal poor stars they have a very simple spectrum of absorption lines. But the fact that they are both both have a similar pattern. Uh, this agreement between the patterns suggests that the R process is universal. So this is what uh, Anna Frevel suggested. And also Cagino here found in all these uh, metal poor stars that these observations, observational facts suggest a rather well-defined origin of heavy elements beyond, beyond iron. We don't know. We don't know if uh, this is maybe only an artifact of nuclear properties such as binding energies and beta decay rates, or it may point to a single cosmic site with astrophysical conditions that are generated uniformly throughout cosmic time. So basically, we have an open question: of What happened? How elements are created throughout the R process? So. Let me get a little bit of water. All right. <clears throat> so we, um, as we are here in South Africa, and South Africa is a special place in the sense that you have lots of things, lots of possibilities. You can go to salt which is one of the largest, it was up to, uh, until recently, one of the second largest telescope in the world. It's one of the largest uh, telescopes still in the world. And you can actually ask for observation time. And that's what we did, uh, getting the high resolution spectroscopy, a recent device here uh, built in Durham in the UK. And we applied for, for observation time in 2015 and 2016. Uh, I just lost the 
I can see there, but not here. Like the computer switch off. Ah, uh, it's because this thing was uh, was off. <laughs> Sorry, my computer just the 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 plug was off. Uh, yeah, the power went down. Sorry, my battery is very it's very limited. So let me just quickly just uh, it was on the wrong side. So let me just uh, get back to you. Sorry about that. Okay, here we are. Just a second. So reminder, here we go. Enjoying webinar, right? Um, okay. All right, here we are again, share screen. I should, uh, everything is okay, right? So share. Um, here we go. Um, let me see. Sorry for those online, just uh, I lost the power, and now we are back. I was showing you this slide here where we propose the observation of metal poor stars using the high resolution spectroscopy at salt. And as I showed you before, this is our sun. Lots of population one star, lots of absorption lines. You know, you don't understand something, you must go to the simplest case scenario. So you don't go to our sun. Our sun is good because it's close by and there's a lot of information. But then you have metal poor stars where you have an iron one line here, nickel one, you know, iron one here, you know. So this is much easier to extract information from these very poor, very metal poor stars, which uh, uh, it's okay. which happened many years ago, and they are only 0.01 percent of the uh, ah, yeah. Bless you. Sorry. Here we go. So, uh, so this is uh, some of the of the physics of the astronomy that we wanted to do because we can measure those absorption lines, and depending on the ratio of strontium to barium, for instance, you can have if the ratio is less or equal than one, these metal poor stars, the oldest of the stars, these elements were produced through the S process, and if the ratio is between zero minus zero point five and minus 0 0.4, these, these uh, abundances or these uh, elements were created through the R process. There's a very interesting uh, addition to the, to the nuclear physics to have salt around. And many of our students went to salt and they saw the, the beautiful telescope. Uh, we are all involved in getting this thing done. So this is the... Uh, the EC, e, EC object survey, this is done by Dave Kilkenny. And you can see here the uh, ultraviolet minus the blue is high for these metal poor stars. And these are the, the candidates that we have for uh, in our southern hemisphere. All these stars were candidates only for photometry. Normally, you need a little bit of a spectroscopy to determine exactly which star do you, do you, do you prefer to choose. But this was the most metal poor star at that time, this, this black spot here. So we saw something which was probably a good candidate according to the, to the luminosity, the brightness of the star. So as you can see, we did some simulations. Actually, this is done by Blaine Lomberg from the University of the Western Cape. At that time, he was doing the PhD. And he extracted these uh, stellar parameters 
for this star, which is somewhere here in the, in the sky. And, you know, you, we extracted that it was almost 8,000 Kelvin, uh, gravity of G4.5 uh, or 320 meters per square second. And we have a uh, metallicity of one over 100, that one of the sun, and a, a very high radial velocity of 170 kilometers per second, with what, which was typical of a galactic halo star. So this thing still is to, to be published, but uh, we are on our way. So now we move to the nuclear physics side. You know, everything is a, is a, a, a mixture of uh, astronomy, astrophysics, you know, um, uh, nuclear physics, obviously. And we move now what is called the nuclear polarizability. With how, you know, I was introduced to this by studying the deformation of nuclei. So the nuclear polarizability basically is a second order effect of these visual excitations going to the giant double resonance, these um, proton and neutrons out of phase, and then going down to the ground state or going down to the to the first excitation. These visual excitations of the via the giant double resonance may affect the deformation of the final state because this is the deformation is also determined through a, another second order effect in, in Coulomb excitation theory, and they both may compete. So it was very important for me to understand this uh, nuclear polarizability as virtual excitation going up and down. Here you have the matrix element, and it was directly proportional to something called sigma minus two, which I'm going to define in a little bit. But here is what happened, actually. You have this uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian, this uh, polarizability or this electric field, which is time-dependent, and it may not go with the polarizability vector, creating a torque and enhancing the rotation, the rotational motion of nuclei. So these have to be corrected in, in nuclear physics. I just mentioned briefly, this is the way you determine. And this, um, the, the crossing here, it, it have a, mini, a minimization also. But the crossing determine the shape of nuclei. This positive is, uh, as you can see here, is oblate. This negative is prolate. And so we determine the shapes of nuclei, which are like a few Fermi, you know, 10 to the minus 15 meters. Something which is quite amazing if you think about it. So let's go back to the polar nuclear polarizability. It was introduced by Migdal in 1945. You know, when you have pressure, imagine this guy. It was Second World War. Finishing Second World War, I came with this beautiful paper, which was known by everyone. We celebrated this paper for many years to come. So it was the beginning of the giant double resonance introduced by, by Migdal, Arkady Migdal. And you have here, again, the question. This is what the sigma minus 2 I mentioned before is defined between 0 and infinity of the total absorption cross-section of that giant double resonance, which accounts for most of the absorption or the emission of, of radiation in nuclei. It's very important to study when you do military things. You know, you want to know the cross section. You know, want to know how much damage you can produce. So this thing, there's a lot of data being utilized for these giant lab resonances. We're using it for the good thing. There's always a good thing and a bad thing in life, right? So this total photo absorption cross section. Remember, this is e gamma squared integrated in the the range of e gamma between zero and infinity. This zero and infinity obviously doesn't exist. This infinity depends on the experimental details. And normally, the zero is the neutron separation energy. So Migdal deduced from the hydrodynamic model using a macroscopic model and a microscopic model, uh, which was this one, deduced that sigma minus 2 has this power law formula here, which was later confirmed by Levinger and myself. So symmetry energy, again, is inversely proportional to the nuclear polarizability. This is the important part I want you to see. And with these two relations, also we can have a formula for the symmetry energy, which characterize the drip line in, uh, in nuclei. So this was Migdal, you know, proposing the formula, which agree with Mig uh, I mean, this was Levinger, which, uh, who proposed this with the available data, very scarce data. And he agreed with the formula 
proposed by Levinger, but he introduced this polarizability parameter because for light nuclei, he didn't agree. We have much uh, larger polarizabilities for these loosely bound nuclei. So the nuclear polarizability is enhanced there, but it follows uh, the power law above mass 20. So this was the data that we I collected uh, from a recent evaluation, 1988. As you can see, the formula, this was Levinger. This was my formula here, 2.38. It was as a fit to data, nothing very, very relevant. But we could see that there, were, that there was a lot of data here, which was not following the straight line. And it was because of the, in this light nuclei, in this self-conjugate nuclei with the same number of protons and neutrons, we have to consider also the, the, the gamma p, the photoproton cross-sections, which are important. And we saw that, obviously, we have this, for light nuclei, we have a kappa greater than one. And for these other nuclei, we have kappa less than one, which once we include the gamma p, everything is okay. This follows the trend because this is only photoneutron cross-section and don't have any gamma p, any photoproton cross-section because the Coulomb bar is very high. So they don't contribute. So here we have what the work that we did with, with seven with Tenny. Uh, we published several papers and we show we saw for the first time that there was a, an indication of shell effects as you go in any semi-magic nucleus, N28, N50, N82, and 126. These are magic numbers for neutrons. As you can see, there was a drift, a drop in the in the in the sigma minus two values. And this was uh, a way to uh, vision, to envision um, shell gaps in nuclei at high excitations. So as you can see, sigma minus two values, they are sensitive measures of the long range correlations of the nuclear force. So then obviously we can use that as, uh, as masses, as, as used to determine when you have a shell closure, which are very important, obviously, to determine the uh, stability of nuclei, because when you have a shell gap, nuclei become more more stable, right? That's the well, that's the whole thing of the of the of the shell model, because essentially, it's more difficult to propagate particles. They have to cross first. You have to break a pair. They have to cross this shell gap, which requires lots of energy. So. We also propose sigma minus two as sensitive measures of the uh, long range correlation of the nuclear force. And here we have, you know, this drop of sigma minus two values published in physics letters B. And here we have also what I mentioned before. I explain by using the symmetry energy in, this, in these two papers, I explain the enhancement for light nuclei, which was due to uh, Migda in this formula, he used the uh, parameter that was known at the time, the 23 MeV, for the symmetry energy in this uh, formula right here. So he used for the symmetry energy in, in this formula, inversely proportional to alpha, he used a constant, 23 MeV, but obviously we know now it's not a constant, but it has a mass dependence. It was shown by Tian and collaborators here from the binding energies of isobaric nuclei. We have the symmetry energy, which is not a constant. It's not the 23 MeV in the books, but it has a trend here where if we include that trend called the leptodermus approximation in the equations uh, that the, the, I showed before, we can explain easily this uh, enhancement of uh, nuclear polarizability for loosely bound light nuclei. There are many parameters, and it's a dangerous game to play in the market. There are many mean field calculations done, and many you know highly highly uh, demanding computing calculations demand uh, to calculate these symmetry uh, energy parameters. There's the surface volume and the surface parameter, and you can see uh, there's not real uh, uh, convergence on what we know what the, the experimental data is. We are missing some of the gamma p, but also um, this is part of our program because we have a Coulomb excitation program where this 
two nuclei are the only ones which have been measured through Coulomb excitation. But we can get a bunch of them and do a systematic Coulomb excitation study of those nuclei and see how this, uh, what, what, uh, what, the, what, what trend do they follow this surface and volume uh, symmetry energy parameters, which are re relevant to the uh, to neutron stars, to the equation of state, which is very important. So all this information was published in a review article in uh, polarizability effects in atomic nuclei, and is um, available there. We went farther. We kept investigating this gamma p contribution, which was which was missing, as I mentioned before, um, through the evaporation model of uh, Blatt and Weisskopf, and uh, adding this uh, this uh, neutron level density and the separation between uh, this is the proton separation and this is the neutron separation including all those into the into the evaporation model we could explain nicely this experimental data here the squares and these are the the red circles that i calculated so you can explain nicely the trend by having a gamma p to gamma m ratio of large you know two three four five six that's why before you were missing that that those data they were down and didn't follow the trend because these gamma p contributions are very important for light nuclei where the coulomb barrier is not so high so this was also published and just recently last uh, this month actually 12th of october 2023 we also published a shared model calculation i mentioned before that these are vir virtual excitations electric dipole virtual excitations from the ground to the giant dipole resonance and going back to the ground state so we calculated all these e1 matrix elements going up and down thousands of them the bookkeeping on this was like like very very difficult to keep all these e1s up and down so we calculated all these thousands of matrix elements as you can see things seem to have a trend at least theoretically and experimentally uh kind of but we have uh, we have a case here to study more uh, more nuclei either experimentally or theoretically so we have just uh, regarding that point experimentally there's some issues with the previous knowledge that we have all this information that was extracted to study the nuclear bombs now we know that it wasn't so good anymore and this we were missing this right shoulder because of the how the photon neutron cross sections were determined because for the gamma n you have the different gamma n gamma 2n gamma 3n gamma mp so you have different uh, possibilities and the different uh, the different weight of each one was not measured properly before and this has been taken nowadays into consideration so we are improving the experimental data as well as the theory and you can see here the symmetry energy with the formulas that we used before and extracted as i mentioned here we uh, actually we got some of the students the students to do this plot from, from the minus math science they started this as a project it was a student project and then still some of them are in the paper in the monthly notices of the royal astronomical society and this particular lepidermis approximation was uh, chosen in account of its better fit to the masses of isobaric nuclei and here we can see the same plot we uh, after discussions with my colleagues with uh, in india because they have the data they we discuss how to extract the information this was uh, we did this for the ground state t equals zero is the ground state and this was uh, this is the formula that we use from the giant double resonance parameters this is the the energy of the giant dipole resonance and this is the width of the giant dipole resonance with these parameters we deduce for each of the nucleus a data point which determine the symmetry energy converging around 27 MeV. Similar equation was used for the four nuclei. We use the Danos, uh, Danos uh, equations and then we deduce the symmetry energy for the ground state of nuclei temperature zero kelvin or well, not zero kelvin 
al menos pues es de, de, de gran estrella zero MV, basically. There's no oxidation of a nucleus. So then we assume something called the bring axle hypothesis, where bring and axle, uh, they uh, they um, they say actually that a GDR can be built on every state of a nucleus, right? So basically, that could help us to study excited state giant dipole resonances, not only build on the ground state like this one, but also build on these states here at moderate uh, average temperatures and a spin similar to central energies. They present actually the, the ground state resonances and these GDRs build on excited states. They present similar characteristics. So we use the similar equation that we use for the ground state. As you can see here, you have the ground state GDR, and this is the excited state GDR. So they seem to follow a very similar pattern. So up to certain temperature, about 1 MeV. Uh, after you know you go higher, then the nucleus becomes deformed, and things start changing. The GDR starts broadening, and there are other effects like the damping, which affects the, the, the properties, and the, the diverse, they, they, they are different to the ground states. So this is also another phenomenon that ha may happen below the neutron separation energy, this gamma strength function, which is quite uh, popular at the Temba Labs and the uh, University of Oslo. They do a lot of work on this and this enhancement as because the E gamma square may have some, some influence in our uh, polarizability. But then we move on and say, okay, this is this is not the, the temperature that the, the, the temperature equals zero MeV is not what what uh, we are interested in because we're interested in neutron star mergers we're interested in the neutron capture which happens as I say before 0 0.4 0 0.5 MeV happens at a high excitation in nuclei so these explosions whatever mass measurements we have they happen always for the ground state so we needed to explore what happens when the nucleus get excited at those particular temperatures of in this case we went to the available data 0.7 to 1 MeV and you can see this was the t equals zero that which I showed before and this is the, the data for between a range of 0.7 and 1 MeV and you can see there's a big change in the trend of the symmetry energy now it converges more like a 31 MeV which as I showed at the beginning the same empirical formula will change because the nuclei will become more unbound, right? A negative sign on the, on the same empirical mass formula that I showed at the beginning. So there are different reasons why this should happen. And one of them is that the, there's an effective mass of the nucleon as the temperature increases, the nucleon mass decreases, and this was predicted by by uh, Donati in this PRL paper. I just recently went to Germany and it was confirmed by other theoreticians that this was the case. Actually, I don't know if I forgot to put the names here or not. Yeah, I forgot to put the names. More theoretical papers which agree with this effective mass change in the in the nucleum, the nucleum mass. And now we we go and we breathe a little bit. So this is the information that we have experimentally from about 0.75 here to 1.3 MeV. This is for the nucleus uh, 201 TL, and this couple 63, this technician 97. As you can see, in this range, the uh, symmetry energy here doesn't change much. So as we go down, this is supposed to be 50 MeV, kilonova go down, to, go down in temperature to 0.71 MeV, temperatures where this seed nuclei are produced, and then we go below 0.5 where neut neutron capture actually happens and the elements are produced and nurtured there. So we are missing this information here, right? We are missing the information below 0.7 MeV. So we can consider that this, uh, eventually there will be a, a change. This cannot be constant all the time because you're going down to the ground state, which has a different uh, pattern for the symmetry energy. So there was a there will be a, a phase change here, phase transition, which we don't know what it is, but that's part of the interesting problem and part of this journey. So now let's imply, let's see, let's see the implications of 
this uh, symmetry energy having 23.7 as in the nuclear physics books compared to the atomic mass evaluation of 20, 20, 2020. And you can see there's a beautiful uh, agreement. However, if you use the symmetry energy of 30 or 31, obviously the agreement is not there anymore because nuclei at those temperatures, at those high excitations, where uh, these stellar explosions happen and where neutron stars uh, and neutron uh, uh, capture happens to create elements, you can see that nuclei become more unbound. This is the binding energy per nucleon. Nuclei become more unbound, unbound and then what happens is that our nuclear shard, which is quite fat here, it becomes a little bit narrow down, it closing, the neutron drip line closing. So in a way, it shrinks in a way that we don't have all these exotic ways to produce elements, but we have a particular way to create them. So this convergence of the symmetry energy for, for heavy nuclei establishes the frontier of this neutron drip line if this is bigger, this gets that way. It push up and gets everything becomes narrower. And this is the closing of the neutron drip line. Sorry, this is the other way. As you can see here, a little bit of a, on the drip line calculation, what the, the binding energy look like for the drip line as you have 27 MeV and 31 MeV. There's a closing of the neutron drip line with uncertainties there. Uh, and this was not done right now. We experimentally, we have confirmed or we have suggested this, but this was not the first time that it was suggested. As you can see here, uh, Hermann and Fold uh, calculated a very large symmetry energy, um, already predicted a closing neutron drip line for heavy elements and hence argues against the production of super heavy elements by the R process in supernova. And Gorelli, Stefan Gorelli, doing some calculations. He actually did some macroscopic calculations versus macro macroscopic calculations. And he, again, the universality of the R process abundances could possibly be explained by the rapid drop of microscopic neutron capture rates at increasing neutron excesses, right? Basically, where the symmetry energy increases which constrains the process flow to remain in the narrow region of the nuclear short characterized by low beta half-lives and large neutron capture rates. So as you can see, we have made a road, a road trip from Cape Town to Joburg, and we have not taken this route, you know, to go to Joburg because it's much longer. So basically what we are saying here, if we go to Cape Town to Joburg, we better, we better take the N1, and these exotic paths to get to them to, to Joburg is not going to be a, a energy efficient to reach from here to there. So basically, we are cutting down, we are narrowing down, or we are proposing that. Still, there's a lot of uh, work to be done. As I mentioned before, we need to go even down in temperature. It was recently published, like a couple of weeks ago, 20th of October, uh, in Nature Africa. They asked me to write something like this, and you can see. You have the picture here of my collaborators, but they took this because they like the Gamka thing and they want to make another another story about Gamka, which hasn't been done. And conclusions, there are many conclusions here we have used, but basically a larger symmetry energy in this temperature range results in a closing neutron drip line, which constrains the R process flow and narrows down the nucleosynthesis path which provides an explanation to the universal pattern of R process abundances observed in galactic halo nuclei and up sun. Caution, I, got to, I cannot tell you a, a, a bad car, but we have to understand that the car is missing some of the pieces here. We know the same empirical mass formula. There are more sophisticated mass models which are not accurate enough. Um, there's the bring axial hypothesis, which we assume, and we assume there's a similar temperature dependence below T0.7 MeV, which we don't know yet. So we are proposing new experiments on GDRs built on, on excited states, experiments with the GAMCA array at the Temba labs, 
the other measurements that we have from nuclear polarizability at the Denver Labs, at CERN, and elsewhere. What happens far from instability? We have some proposal. And also, obviously, we have, uh, now we have a recent infrared high resolution spectroscopy, the spectrograph at SALT, which is more sensitive to these metal poor stars. And we are going to propose new, new observations to complement our nuclear physics studies. So this is GAMCA, as I am uh, the PI for GAMCA, I should mention that a little bit. I was given this today, it was May 2021, but I just learned about this uh, uh, NRF news. This is a consortium of five univer uh, four universities and Itemba Labs, University of Western Cape, Stellenbosch University, WITS, and University of Sululand. This was the single largest grant given by the NRF in a competitive call for a new spectrometer called the, GAM the Gamma Ray Spectrometer for Knowledge in Africa, GAMCA. Many people doubted that the project will ever see the light of day, but UWC is not saying this, <laughs> it's like the NRF. So the project was composed of a consortium, as I mentioned just right, right now, and uh, basically, you know, it's, it's already being commissioned. It's at the Temba Labs. We have two frames. We have new possibilities to be a world leaders in the field. And these are the things that were bought through GAMCA. And this is the physics, a wide range of nuclear physics and nuclear astrophysics phenomena, such as I mentioned before, nuclear deformation, short uh, nuclear lifetimes, angular distributions, gamma strength functions, nuclear polarizability, and giant dipole resonances. Lots of things were bought so through the GAMCA project. Global detectors, high purity germanium detectors, uh, BGO shields, anti compton shields, large lanthanum bromide detectors, which will be ideal for this giant double resonance study. Two frames, we have the soccer ball, and here is the, the, the dandelion frame, and digital electronics, high voltage supply, a huge liquid nitrogen system, which uh, keeps all these detectors at cool temperatures, at running temperatures, and then I'm going to present this. I was just invited to go in general to the Intrans uh, workshop in Paris, in France, to present about GAMCA to the uh, international collaborators. And of course, I cannot uh, forget our INSA. INSA is India-South Africa collaboration. And uh, now in VISA, because we're getting also the, the Vietnamese collaborators here to study the the theoretical implications of the giant dipole resonances. And uh, this is Balaram, here is Rigid, Deepak. And here we have Brendan Lesh, UWC student, Seven Gwatseni, and Andile Sulu, who were part of this honors program. And they uh, remain as co authors in the paper. So we like to follow the motto of this book Monday starts on Saturday. Monday starts on Saturday, which means that there's no weekend <laughs> for the scientists, you know? And they had accepted as a working hypothesis that happiness lies in the constant recognition of the unknown, which is also the meaning of life. So these guys will remain, will prefer to get and discuss science, discuss physics, and make things, you know, interesting, and make new discoveries, and, you know, what I mentioned before, follow this Ithaca journey to whatever it is, and then you, you're happy with it. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Yeah, thank you very much, Nico. Any questions for Nico from the audience? <clears throat> yeah, Jingxian. I got seven questions. Uh, maybe, Maybe from um, just uh, two first. Uh, one is you, you show this A sim um, as a function of the atomic number A, and there seems to be some asymptotic limit towards high value of A. What's, right. the, what's the physics behind this asymptotic limit? So uh, that's, a, that's the convergence of, uh, of the neutron drip line. So the, the number, that number characterizes how far you can go into the neutron capture of elements. The number, the larger the number, the shorten, the, the close in, you shrink the the nuclear shards of nuclei. Let me just see. 
Me han cogido, en serio. I think my question relates on how you define your a uh, sub sim so that uh, so that uh, then so, I would understand why that's okay 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 so, yeah. let me just go quickly the the symmetry energy is characterized from the uh, parameters of the giant double resonance as I can see here you see this was done this same formula here it comes from the hydrodynamic model of Danos you know and then you have so the symmetry energy is related to these properties to the giant double resonance the center of the energy here, and the width of the giant double resonance, right? So this, as we assume that the giant double resonances, they have similar properties for the ground and for the excitation. We can go for T equals zero to the temperatures where neutron capture happens. So basically we are determining things from the experimental uh, GDR parameters. Okay, uh, and another thing is, um, so this sigma minus two, which you defined, yeah. um, so that is the integration of some cross section thing. And so this is the integration of the of the, of the photo, ab there photo absorption a, cross section. This is a very important. Uh, I should go the other way. There was a formula of oh. that. Uh, Sorry, I just closed it down. So there's a formula. It goes from zero to infinity. Uh, let me see. So this is the formula here. Uh, this one here, right? Uh, so yeah. we take we take the. Um, there was uh, another page as well which has that formula. Okay, you want the page? Okay, sorry, this is a little bit strange. Yeah. So this one you want or which page you want? Uh, this one. The previous one, but I think there's a. Yeah, yeah. This, this one, one here. Okay. So this is coming uh, from the oscillator strength. So this is uh, the zero to infinity sigma total is the for the absorption cross section, which is mostly given by the absorption of this giant dipole resonance. This giant dipole resonance emit most of the radiation in nuclei is through that giant giant dipole resonance. So most of this cross section, this is the total cross section that we see here in this plot. Let me show you. So we go through the literature and we got all the, let me see, uh, well, this is one of those. This is one of those, you see. This is giant double resonance for this particular nuclei, but I also mentioned something here. This is another giant double resonance. So this is the photoneutron cross section. That's the sigma total on the, on the, on the, on the numerator, right? So we integrate this between zero and whatever is the, up, the upper limit here. But obviously, the low energy is going to be important, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I I see that formula. If if we go to that page, um, uh, no, uh, yeah, the previous page, yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. yeah. So I I see this formula. Just just a little bit explanation. Uh, I see this formula as a way of comparing the electric force. So e squared divided by h bar c, it would be the fine structure constant, right. which is characterize the electric force. And then therefore this sigma would capture the uh, the the neutron capture process, which is related to the strong force. So I see this formula as a ratio between the electric force over the some sort of a a, a strong force. So therefore, the stronger the strong force is, then uh, then you would uh, uh, lead to less asymmetric. Means a stronger nuclear uh, force would be uh, you would uh, therefore the less asymmetric, uh, less neutron uh, would be, so that the the nuclear can be stable. So so this would be you know to me this is a a way of 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 making the ratio between electric force and nuclear force. Okay. Uh so yeah, but you have to consider that this, this is, uh, we're talking about nuclei. So we are talking about the long range of the nuclear force, here, the long range. So not, we're not considering the QCD or the, you know, the 197 point, well, this is, yeah, this is 197.3 and this 144 MeV Fermi, 1.44 MeV Fermi, right? Yes. And this is 197.3 MeV Fermi. Yes. So they cancel each other 1.44 over almost 200, right? Yes. So is that like about 0 0.1? So 
So these are just constants here. And you say that this is the ratio of what? Or the, or the strong force? No. Yeah, I, I see this formula as the ratio between the electric force E squared divided by H bar C. We here you, pro, you probably use the Gaussian unit, so one over. We use Gaussian unit, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that is unity. So E squared divided by H bar C would be equals one over one thirty seven, which is a strong, which is a, sorry the uh, fine structure constant, right? Which characterizes the, the strength of the electric force. Right. So I see this formula as a ratio between electric of force. Of course, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Over the uh, over the strong force. Over there. So that the stronger the strong force is, then the less a uh, a uh, sub a sim would be because it need less uh, uh, neutrons. Right, the right, right, right. That's a, that's actually a very good point. Thank you. That's a very good point. I, I really like that interpretation. Thanks, thanks for Michael, and thanks for the talk. But well, I'm just puzzled in here because the sigma in its definition from the above also contains an E squared. So I think the E squared actually cancels out in that formula. But I have another question on, well, actually more general question on, on your study. So this, so you uh, explored the temperature dependence of ASUM, okay? And then you substituted that back into the empirical mass formula. Okay, so, but in that, when you did that, you kept all the other constants in that mass formulas temperature independent. Is there any reason or good motivation to do that, or that's, should they also uh, be temperature dependent? Well, that's that's a very good point because uh, normally these constants are the Coulomb force. They're going to be the Coulomb force independently, right? That constant will 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 be the same for for all nuclei. So these for these constants have been worked out independently. But that's a good point. I always have that question myself, whether there are other constants that may influence. But, uh, you know, like the, the pairing in this empirical mass formula, you have also the pairing term. But this pairing terms is, is, is negligible compared to the, to, the, to the symmetry energy. So the symmetry energy always have characterized mostly that, uh, that binding energy or, or that Newton drip line. Because this term, the surface or the volume or the Coulomb term, they are the same for, nu for any nucleus. This will change. The pairing term will change depending on you have an even or not nucleus, right? So this will change, but the contribution is much smaller than this. And what about the temperature dependence of ACE, or the volume, surface, and so on? So the sorry, which which question? Yeah. So is there also temperature dependence in in the other um, constants? Like uh, yeah, in the in the so, symmetry energy, uh, as we extracted from the from the GDR parameters, you mean? But you, the I on the way. I'm just talking about the other uh, constants in the mass formula. So, for example, the A sub volume. Is there any temperature dependence in in them as well, or is it, are there uh, are they known to be temperature independent? Well, I I I don't know that hundred percent. So I would say that that's a, a good a good question, but I will assume you know the radius. So most of the information that we have we have is for the for for the ground state. That's a that's a and then the the radius of the nucleus is given by R equal 1.2 a to the one third Fermi, right? So that's a formula comes from from electron uh, measurements, electron in scattering measurements. So that's done for again for for and that's assumed to be a constant, you know, a, a nuclei. That's supposed to be for a for a for a spherical uh, nucleus for a for a spherical nucleus, but it's to be it's supposed to be constant. We always assume it's a constant in nuclei. Whereas that doesn't change, does it change or not? I, I, of course, I don't, I, don't, I don't know 100%. That's the information we get from uh, electron E prime measurements and the, the, the mean square radius. But uh, that's what we know. Thank you. Sean? Thanks, Nico. Thanks, Thanks. for bringing the stars back to Earth. Thank you. Um, the paper that you presented, um, which was done with Alex Brown, yeah, um, you're referring to. I just want to see it. You're referring somewhere to a finite range um, drop 
droplet model. Right. Yeah. Does the finite range approximation fit into that? So that that's kind of a microscopic microscopic approximation, and this this uh, is the Lepidermus approximation that I mentioned before, and those are the that's the Lepidermus approximation for the polarizability parameter determined from the uh, from Moller's uh, FRDM, right? So this is a, a, a these are models based on the Yukawa potential. So I'm based on, on, on empirical ma masses, but they actually is a mass model basically. And if we use the parameters determined for the uh, for the Lepidermus approximation, we see that we have this trend here. So which agrees nicely with the with the blue points in this in that work, right? So we need, still need to do the we still to come. The uh, ground, the 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 type of polarizability from shell model calculations for the uh, excitations of nuclei, right? Because that's what we are aiming at. But before we need to do this one, because it was uh, it, it is easy again. We can compare with empirical data. Again, empirical data mostly goes to the ground states. Everything, all the information, most of the information that we know. I mean, there's a high spin studies and all this. But most of the information in this regarding this uh, type of polarizability, uh, atomic masses, they always refer to ground states. Sometimes you have an isomatic, you have a mass for an isomatic state, but those are rare. Okay. <clears throat> are there further questions? No, uh, Rene, can you confirm that there are no more questions from our online audience? Sorry, okay, perfect. And uh, Nico, thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you very much to pleasure. the online participants and to the real